Cool, so we'll, we'll go on and get started on up. Um, hi everyone, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm your monthly host at A2 New Tech. I took this over from uh, Zach Steinler as the monthly host back in September. And uh, hey, I'm still here, so that's a good sign. Um, thanks for coming out this, this month for uh, show of hands for first timers. All right, awesome. It's always about a third. I'm always impressed that there's a third new people coming each time. And, and thanks everyone for coming out again who have been here in the past. Um, as you've heard me say, the, this is all about uh, getting together in person. So we're all super busy, We've got a lot going on, interesting you know, career ventures and, and personal hobbies. Um, but there's a lot of amazing entrepreneurs and tech individuals uh, right here in Ann Arbor. Um, but it's not always easy to connect with them. So H2 New Tech has been happening monthly since 2009, 2010. And uh, it's just been a, a great event for both people get the opportunity to pitch their, their company, um, get feedback from audience, and uh, number one thing I just remind everyone who's attending is just meet at least one person here that you're gonna connect with after this event. Um, and it just makes it a lot, lot easier to have this community feel uh, it's physically present, not just virtually. Um, so, um, you know, our format, uh, it's the third Tuesday of each month, and our format is typically five companies, five minute pitch. Um, I, the, the stage company that you're in, um, basically what I say is like, if you've done some customer validation, whether they've given you money or not, that's a good sign that it'll be a good pitch for here. If not, talk to me anyway, and I'll tell you how to get to that point. Um, we usually do five minute pitch, five minute Q&A. We have three companies tonight, so we're gonna make it six minute pitches, why not? And we'll have a little bit of extra time for Q&A. Um, if you know somebody, like a company that fits that profile, uh, have them find me, um, either my day job, I work at Nutshell downtown, or email organizers at a2newtech.org. And uh, we'll continue to be here through this whole semester, thanks to Bryce and everyone else who's helped uh, the U of M uh, Law School and Entrepreneurship Cl Clinic, who has been hosting us for a few years now. Um, let's see, so, oh yeah, I'll continue my monthly uh, podcast uh, recommendations because uh, many of them are repeats, but I got a couple, a couple new ones, I think. So I'm still listening to uh, Andreessen Horowitz's podcast a bunch. Intercom.io, uh, uh, there's including their like head of product, the recent one's really awesome. And I like Recode Decode, which I didn't think I'd like, like a major one done by Kara Swisher, formerly a Wall Street Journal, um, but it's really good. And, and I actually have, besides Serial, I have one non, other non-tech podcast to recommend. Um, anyone have heard of Dan Carlin, the, the historian guy? All right, so if you haven't, go check him out. He's got two podcasts, one's called Hardcore History, and the other is common sense. So they're like, um, uh, he, he described himself described armchair historian, but he does, he does an amazing job of tying in history into both current events and like telling these incredible stories that, you know, sometimes it's, it's more accessible in that way. So there's my new one to recommend. And yes, new episode of Serial this Thursday. They put us off by a week. Um, so uh, we'll do we'll, we'll get all three go through all three companies and then we'll have time for community announcements at the end. All things go. If you have any idea, if you're trying to start a meetup, if you've got one to plug, if you're hiring, if you're looking for a job, think about that now. It's all on the table and totally fair to announce. Um, our thanks to a bunch of people, including Roger down here in front, Roger Rail of R2 Vive. He records this every month, does an awesome job editing it, putting the slides together. And um, yeah, it's just great to have all this archived. So if you go explore the meetup group, you can actually go back and not only see everybody that's presented and when, but um, watch it. Um, so really, really great. Um, A2 Geeks is a nonprofit uh, that some of you might have heard of. Um, they help make events like this possible and others like Coffee House Coders. I know they're currently looking, I think, for a new um, board member also. So if you have any interest in getting involved in a local board and you like events like this, uh, talk to me and I'll connect you with the right people. Um, with that, uh, we also always go out to Pizza Hut House afterwards, so if you have to cut out early and you want to meet up later, we'll be over there. Um, with that, I think we'll get ready for our first presenter. Um, so mute your phones, 
if you must use them and you want to tweet, A2 New Tech is the hashtag. And first up, I want to welcome uh, Steve Thierry from uh, the Ann, Ar Ann Arbor District Library. And this is a little bit different format than necessarily a company pitch, but Steve's going to be telling us, giving us his pitch of uh, a new initiative that he started at the AADL uh, called Secret Lab. He's been there for a year and a half and formerly was at the Detroit Public Library and is now bringing this to Ann Arbor. So with that, let's welcome Steve. Thanks a lot, Brian, and uh, good to be here. Uh, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's going on at your public library down the street. Uh, if you haven't been there recently, uh, we are doing a lot of new and innovative things. We have a circulating tools collection where you can check out microscopes and telescopes and FLIR heat guns and all sorts of neat things. So uh, come down and, and check us out if you haven't done so recently. Uh, so the Secret Lab is one of our, our newest uh, projects. Uh, our logo of the Secret Lab right up here, uh, if you're familiar with the Ann Arbor District Library, you'll notice that it is actually three of our logos put together uh, to create what I call the spark of creativity. And it's, uh, it was created by our designer in-house and represents uh, what we're doing at the Secret Lab. So this is a photo of the Secret Lab when it first opened up uh, in September of last year. It is a space in the basement of our downtown library, about 2,000 square feet. Uh, it doesn't look like most libraries, you'll notice. Uh, we've created this sort of in response to, uh, we've done crafting programs in the library for a long time, but we really didn't have a space dedicated to that. Uh, so this space, we have a lot of work surfaces, uh, heavy duty tables, we have a lot of storage, uh, we have linoleum floors, and we have a few sinks. So we can host uh, and have a lot of different activities that go on here uh, and we're able to clean up and, and have it ready to go and, and protect other areas of the library uh, for their more traditional uses. Uh, this is a more recent photo, so we have uh, some more equipment, some more storage, uh, just giving you an idea of how the room has progressed. Uh, all of our storage is on heavy duty caster wheels so it can be moved around. Uh, we've also uh, have tables that are easily moved so it's really one giant Lego set and we can configure it to whatever the program uh, or need is. It's, it's not a static space. <laughs> one of the first workshops we started was letterpress printing. Uh, this kind of fits in well with what we do in the library and the book business. Uh, so what we did is we purchased uh, some traditional uh, letterpress equipment. Uh, we did not know much about it, so we found somebody who did. Uh, this woman's name is Liz Lydens. Uh, Liz actually graduated from the Stamp School of Design here at the university, and she now does traditional letterpress printing in the eastern market of Detroit as her day job. Uh, she has customers, uh, for instance, Zingerman's Mail Order, and does custom printing for them. So by hiring outside instructors, we act as facilitators and we let people that really know whatever it is do their thing and teach about the history and the theory uh, and get into uh, to levels of detail that we could not. Uh, this is an example of one of the things we did uh, this past fall. So we, we created this by setting type and printed it out and all of the uh, attendees got to take this home as, as something that they made from the project. Uh, we could then extend this. We did a custom bookbinding program. So we uh, printed on some leftover uh, cardstock from, uh, from previous uses, and then that was hand bound, and they could take that home and use it as a journal. Uh, this is an all ages space. So this is a drawing workshop called Young Rembrandts that we do for younger kids. Uh, the arts are falling out in the schools, so we're, we're doing our part to keep it up. Uh, when we started this last fall, we had 12 or 15 kids that came, and they really enjoyed it. Uh, this was our workshop this past Sunday. We had 45 kids and 25 parents, so we've jumped up to about 70 attendees over the course of a few months. And again, we've had to reconfigure the room to handle that. So you'll see a lot of mobile uh, flip-top tables that come in when needed, and then they go out once we're done using them. 
another sort of crafty but techy uh, project we're working on, these are brother electro -knit knitting machines from the late 1980s. So originally, uh, these hooked up to a Tandy disk drive and you can do 2K of memory worth of knitting. That's about 60 rows by 200. Then it runs out of memory and you have to load up the next part of it. So we're working on getting these uh, up and running and we've also uh, got some serial to USB cables so that they can communicate with modern technology and get patterns loaded up as bitmaps. Uh, this is an electronic music workshop that we run. Um, this particular one, they're talking about compression in music and, and how it's used. Uh, we are going to be doing these again, and a lot of these synthesizers, actually all these synthesizers you see on the table are part of our circulating music tools collection, so you can learn about stuff and then take it home as a rental. Uh, this is from the Pop X series of art <coughs> workshops this past uh, fall. This was a uh, panel discussion they did, so we do host community events uh, and look for partnerships in the community. Uh, this is me doing my cat batting at a ball of yarn yoga pose. <laughs> no, no, actually, uh, this is a giant spirograph we made uh, out of wood that uses sidewalk chalk instead of pen and pencil. And this works by kind of combining art and making and science and getting kids interested. And the kids do use it. So this was from Halloween of last year in the secret lab. Uh, the kids were getting down and enjoying it. Uh, this is Dan Romanchik, a, a local uh, instructor teaching about how to use a digital multimeter. And this is us actually uh, using his instruction to troubleshoot a uh, uh, ink circuit comic one of our librarians, librarians was working on that was having some issues. Uh, and this is a pumpkin we did from last uh, Halloween. So we went over to MakerWorks, friends of ours, threw a pumpkin into the laser cutter and uh, engraved our pumpkin with a 50 watt laser. It smelled very delicious. So I'm out of time, but happy to answer questions. Uh, again, here's uh, my info. If you want to email me, please do. And give us a follow on Twitter at Secret Lab. Thank you very much. I'll kick off a question. What's the origin of this idea? Or like, you, did you do a similar thing at Detroit and then wanted to bring it here? We did. So the idea was we worked with teens after school in Detroit, and they were really smart and creative. And we tried to do things like how to use the internet, how to use Microsoft Office, and kind of traditional learning classes. And the kids never came. And we asked why, and they said, well, we know all this to begin with. And second of all, we've been in class all day, so we don't want to sit in another class now that we're out. So we like this because it's informal learning, it's actually making learning hands-on, it's a lot of different areas that can cross, and you just kind of work with people, and, and you might be an electronics person, but then you see somebody working on a wearable or textile, and then maybe you're working on something together. And we had boys that love to knit, we had girls that love to do robots, so you just never know, and, and it's great to see what comes out once you give people some, some basic skills to work with. It's really cool. We also have some questions for Steve. Start over there. Uh, the Pachinko machine uh, was donated by Eli Nyberger, our deputy director. Uh, it, it is mechanically functional, electronically not functional. So he said anybody who wants to take a crack at fixing it is welcome to. They can't make it any worse. So if you're interested <laughs> in playing Pachinko without the lights or coming down and trying to get them uh, to work again, come on down. Uh, how does this, uh, or how do you see this fitting in with um, things in the community like MakerWorks and like All Hands Active and some of the other public? Sure, that's a good question. So we don't see ourselves as a makerspace per se. Uh, you know, a lot of the things we do have been happening in libraries for a long time. This is just sort of leveling them up a bit. Uh, we are friends with MakerWorks and All Hands Active, uh, Backyard Brains, uh, Brain Monkeys. We will never be a full maker works. We don't have a wood shop, we don't have a metal shop. We're in the basement of the library, we can't have welding. So what we do is we give people easy discoverability to these things or, or the things that we're able to do. And if they like it, that's great. They can work with us. And then if they want to jump up to like a full-fledged full maker space like MakerWorks, we're happy to show them how to. 
So we, we can do some pretty cool stuff with the things that we do have, but we don't consider ourselves competing with them. We're just uh, another node in the city and we're a way for people to, uh, to easily find out about it. <coughs> yes? And is uh, there a list of events up on the Anniversary Library website? Yep, if you go to our website, we have an events engine that lists all of our events and it's located there. Uh, we also have brochures that we uh, put out for adults, teens, and youth, and uh, wherever it is gonna be held in the secret lab, it'll say so and, and let you know. Any other questions? Yes? Why is it a secret? Why is it a secret? That's a good question. So a secret lab is kind of like uh, in superhero comics, it's where you kind of hone your skills and create, uh, create what you then bring forth and, and give to the world. So that's what we sort of see this as. This is where you can kind of come down and, and work on yourself and, and create good stuff. And then you can come out of the basement and, and show forth what you've been working on. Any other questions? All right, well, I will be around after if you have any more, and please feel free to contact me. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad we did that extended. Maybe some of you have been thinking of a project you wanted to work on on the side and didn't have access to some equipment. So that, that could be a good way to learn about all the other access you have here in town to places like MakerWorks where you know, access to a CNC machine and, and different capabilities. So um, cool, hope you enjoyed that. So, so next up I would like to welcome uh, Jackie and Kristen. Um, they, they connected uh, at, I don't know if it was originally TechArb, but they're, they're currently incubating this project they're working on at TechArb. Uh, Kristen's finishing up a, a HCI human computer interaction degree at the School of Information here at U of M. And uh, yeah, I'll just re I'll reread their pitch. Um, so the Broke app is a redesign of the mobile banking application to help banks reach, retain, and teach millennials um, and help them build wealth for future um, based on their current spending habits. Um, so, oh, you need that. It's fine. It started cutting off. Um, so I've, I've been trying to get them to present here at New Tech for a couple of months. And, you know, we had holidays and some scheduling stuff, so I'm really excited that they're able to present today. Laptop uh, promising. Usual. No, no. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, is it just kicking off when you yeah, present? It's just off. Oh. There you go. There you go. Let me see. It might be. Oh, is it moving the screen too small? Yeah. Okay. Let's see what I can do with that. <laughs> yeah, you know what you might have better luck doing is um, presenting in a new window. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. personal finance tool that allows banks to reach, teach, and retain college students. Um, so the problem that we are focusing on. Last year, 33% of millennials changed banks. That's twice the rate of Generation X and six times the rate of baby boomers. So why are millennials changing banks so frequently? Well, one of the principal reasons is mobile technology, or in this case, a lack thereof. Traditionally, well first, 33% of millennials will stay with the bank if they have good online services. The problem though is that traditionally good online services have been reserved for only the biggest banks with the largest budgets. So it's really the mid-sizing community banks that are losing out as the gap continues to grow between the expectations of what millennials want and what the banks are able to provide in terms of innovation. Um, so there's budgeting technology that's already out there. Um, I'm sure some of you may be using some of this technology already, but there's several problems with it. For banks, one of the problems is that this technology isn't made for them, so they can't actually customize the technology for their customers. 
There's also this third step verification process which makes the technology incompatible for a lot of the customers out there that need to input additional information so they can't do the screen scraping correctly. In addition, there's auto categorization issues and also um, for me as a student who takes out loans, two thirds of which all students do, I look awesome in August and January, but after that everything tends to go downhill and my cash flow is in the red and it makes me feel bad and I don't want to look at my finances anymore. So our solution is broke. We have a three-pronged approach. The first one is budgets, which a lot of people don't find very sexy, which is understandable. And the current problem with a lot of third-party technology is that they don't conceive of money the way that we've noticed millennials in our interviews conceive of money. So generally you have like this long bar that says this is your income and you have an even longer bar that says this is what you're like spending money on. Instead of the way that we've noticed that students, particularly college students and all millennials, is they think of their spending in jars. So I have this amount that I spend on rent, this amount that I spend on food, this amount that I spend on coffee, which comes up a lot. But we also want to take advantage of the fact that when you're looking at your bank account, you generally look at your savings and your checking. And you see checking kind of as a free-for-all. And we really want to kind of dampen that down a little bit and make people think of money the way that it's supposed to be, where it's supposed to be fungible. So every dollar is the same as every other dollar. And so if you give every dollar a job, it makes it a little bit more salient. And this also takes into account mental accounting principles, which means that if I have a lock jar and I'm like, oh, well, I need to move money from, I've eaten out a little bit too much this month, so I need to move money from one allocation to another. If I click on one of those lock jars for insurance, I feel really like I don't want to unlock it because that's money that's set aside in particular. So I'm forced to take it from a different jar instead. We're not judging people for moving money. We all have costs, costs are flexible, but you, uh, it makes it more granular what cost is going where. Additionally, there's context. When we were doing interviews, people said, I get $500 this week. By the next week, I have no idea where it's gone. I don't know where I spent that money. So they're really looking to understand what is the whole story and the whole picture that they're, they're doing with their money? Uh, how does it compare to their peers? They have really no idea what their peers are spending on eating out or on rent. And so this is a way of making that a little bit more transparent. So when you're setting up budgets or trying to figure out where you should cut back, you can see what other people are doing. And that helps you make benchmark with your comparison with your spending. And the third part, which people were most excited about when we were doing interviews, is this concept of pushing. And so students are really actually wanting to work with their budgets and they want to work with their money, but they have no idea what to change or where to change it. And so we realized if you actually integrate all of the data, if you integrate my Twitter, my Facebook, my Google Calendar, if you can get all of that information together, you can come up with algorithms that say, hey, Jackie, I've noticed Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30, you're getting coffee at Starbucks, and it looks like your Google Calendar says you have chemistry at 8 a.m. So if you can understand what those two pieces are meeting, we can create a notification that says, hey, there's a 98% chance that you're going to buy coffee this morning. Why don't you get up now and start the pot? And people really like this because they wanted someone to kind of intervene a little bit, but they didn't know where to start. There is a ton of competition out there. A lot of them are doing some things really well and some things not really well, but no one seems to be matching students and millennials where they're at. That's allowing them to be flexible with how they're customizing their budgets, connects to all of their bank accounts, creates locks and locked jars, sets financial goals, gives them context, and gives them actionable notifications. So part of our monetization model is that we would be white labeling this technology. So the banks would pay an initial licensing fee and then um, we would allow them to white label the technology. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why they would do this, um, but the two main ones are increased wallet share and growth. So there are three main components as to why somebody would actually increase their wallet share or the amount of money that they put in the bank. Um, and those three are that if the bank invests in their financial well-being, if they help them reach their financial goals, and if the bank actually customizes their products and services to fit the customer's needs, and Broke aims to do all of that. For students, we're helping them provide awareness, which was one of the main problems. So this is kind of crazy, but um, in one of the studies that we were looking at on overdraft fees, one in 10 students will actually pay $710 in overdraft fees. And it's because of that lack of awareness component. They don't know that they are so close to the edge and then all of a sudden something that they spent on two days later comes back to hit them and then they get the overdraft. Um, so we're going to help students actually save money and millennials. So this is kind of where we're at right now, which is not showing up. 
There we go. So we, uh, Chris and I met at the UMSI New York Innovation Trek last year and we spent a long time doing concept validation and market research to really understand how millennials deal with their money because we find it's very, very different from other generations. And so currently we're finishing up our high fidelity prototype which you've seen some screen grabs from. We're also in the process of developing our MVP and looking for channel partners. And then we're heading towards our first customer and uh, fundraising. So we're here because we want feedback. We want to know what you guys think of the idea, what your, you think your kids would think of the idea. Um, and we also recognize that we're both user experience researchers and designers. We've both came out of the School of Information, so we have a lot of experience with design and with behavioral economics, but not as much with security. And when you're dealing with financial technology, that's a really important component. So we want to make sure that both our customers, the banks, and our users feel really secure in the system that they're using. Uh, so if you have contacts with people that are familiar with HIPAA or other financial <coughs> software, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to them. Uh, and follow us on Twitter. <coughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. You guys have, that's a really great pitch, and you clearly have put a lot of thought into um, all this important, all the important parts up front. So, um, <laughs> questions, who would like to begin? <coughs> so, is your app actually handling the banking transactions? So the app would actually be connected up with the bank on the bank servers, and so the, the transactions would be coming through to the bank, and we'd be collecting information on the transactions on there. <coughs> so, so it's not like a, like a mobile bank <coughs> app? Yeah, no, so it's connected with, it would be connected with your mobile banking application that your bank supplies you. So if you had like U of M Credit Union and we were partnering with U of M Credit Union, that would be a, an additional component to their application. So you could still download the original application that shows you just the balance, or you could download this application that would help you create and monitor the budget. I'm a senior here at University of Michigan, so yeah. like a great analysis for me. I think I would definitely use it. And I love the social aspect, how you're integrating Google Plus and Facebook, and even more square check-ins. Yeah. And I have two questions concerning that. The first is, how long do you think it would take for the system to kind of learn your habits to give you those push notifications? And then also, do you plan on monetizing that information in the future? Uh, so second response, no, which has been hard for our financial modeling quite a bit. Um, we were really conscious of the fact that I, as a student, really um, resent a little bit the fact that all of my data and my habits are being monetized at this point in time. Um, and so we wanted people to feel secure in giving us this information. So if they're, they feel like they're going to be sold something or if their information is going to be sold elsewhere, that they're not going to be willing to buy into the system that we feel like it really needs to make it work. And the end goal was to really help people become financially literate, uh, which was where we started. So we wanted to make sure that people understood that's where we were focused on. The first part is we're still working through the algorithms. And so ideally, you would actually opt into the push notifications because we understand that having the system decide which options you're going to be pushed out isn't beneficial for you. You have to decide actually which parts of your budget, which parts of your financial transactions you want to make that change in. And so us just pushing something out isn't going to work as well for you. Um, so we're still kind of working on figuring out how long those patterns would take. Ideally, you'll be able to import all of your data and we'd be able to make those connections kind of pretty quickly. Who's your target audience? Uh, so our beachhead market are college students. Yeah, so it, the beachhead market for like the bank customers would be college students. So um, any bank that has some type of like uh, retention program for college students or that's who their initial target is, that's who our initial target is for the banks. Um, the reason we chose college students is because that's the point in time that a lot of uh, kids or students uh, become financially independent. Um, so for a lot of kids, as soon as they hit 18 or at some point during the college process, that's when they start becoming financially independent. Uh, well, I'll, tell, I'll give you a little piece of feedback. Uh, sure. I think your head's in the right place because you guys are worried about your kids. Um, if you're going after the undergraduates, yeah. um, I would advise you to consult with parents. A lot of undergraduates, a lot of people in college, yeah, rely on their parents for the finance. No one looks at the conversation with dad about money. So yeah. that could be a huge pain point you're solving. Okay. Good Thank you. Who else? One in the back. Come here. Yeah, so for the categories mm -hmm. and the context, is that up to the banks then to come up with those categories or is that manual input or 
It's defined by the user. So the initial, when you're initially setting up your jars, there is a, a bit of a manual process where you define exactly what you want to be deducted from the jars. Um, so that is an initial manual part, but then the rest is automated. Um, and so one of the pain points that we heard when we were doing customer discovery is that people were frustrated with the auto categorization that a lot of banking apps well, banking apps and also uh, third-party technologies were doing. And so we wanted to do it so we gave the user the power to define it. So there is like a startup cost in that way, but it's still automated in that if you say, um, for example, like my books and supplies, if I get something from lynda.com, I want it to go to my books and supplies jar. It can also say being very useful for new families. Yes. Don't, don't. So, you know, since the uh, EOP's app was from last year, Mint.com is built off of EOP uh, yeah. as a platform, but you know, they're, they're sold, and uh, I don't know who else is coming to replace them. How will you deal with data acquisition? So, where, did you want to address that? Yeah, so we've been looking at Plaid um, mm -hmm. as an API that we would be using. Um, and so, I, I think, because one of the issues or challenges that we have is like a lot of banks aren't happy with their third party legacy systems, or sorry, their legacy systems that they're using, not third party. And so, um, we were looking at maybe initially doing our MVP with using the Plaid API, and then um, for the banks that it does work for, and then working with the banks as like an additional cost to actually set up. Yeah, there, there is a uh, former uh, product manager for First Data here in the audience, okay. in case you want to reveal some stuff later. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. So, another one in the back. Um, I'm not sure if you talked about this, but is it going to integrate just checking the savings accounts, or is it going to calculate, like, um, if you have enough money to pay off your bills or credit cards? Yeah, so the question was um, if you, if there was going to be integration with checking or savings, um, or if, what was the second part? Um, if it's going to calculate, you have enough money to pay off your credit cards. Okay, or if it's going to calculate enough money to pay off your credit cards. Um, so one of the challenges, again, if, you're, if we're providing the technology to the banks, we can't have integration with additional technologies into the application. Um, with outside banks. With outside which banks. Which is one of the, the problems that we're currently struggling with is that you have these small to mid-sized banks that really needed technology to rate, retain their users um, and who in turn really need the smaller community bank later on in life. Um, but I think the credit card, we, there's an additional component that we haven't integrated in. We have to show the screens at least, which has to do with the goals section and that's something that paying off credit cards or paying off student loans would be in that section as well. Question Hi. Hey. I love the jar. Um, we are familiar with buckets of money and all of it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's a visualization, it's behavioral and commodification. It's very, there's a lot of data behind that. Yeah. I, I love that. I wonder, <clears throat> since this is a, a one institution, so it's, it's different from it's different from other things that are out there. Yeah. Because Mint is essentially an aggregator of your information in a way to, to help you manage that information, but you can't really do anything with it in a minute. Uh, so you know, on the on the plus side, you're, it sounds to me that um, like in this app, you can actually take action with your bank, as opposed to looking at my new app and saying, oh, I need to do X, Y, or Z, and then, oh, now I've got to go to my bank. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, one, of the, one of the additional components that we thought is, so um, when we were talking to banks, they really talked about not only like the loss of the customer, but really that loss of ability to educate the customer. And really, the customer not realizing that when they switch banks to a larger bank, they're losing out on the ability in five or 10 years to get a loan from that bank because mm -hmm. they don't have that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And so this is another way of the bank really understanding what your habits are and what your trends are so they can then in initiate that contact and that, that help to really help educate you like, with what you're doing, but also create much more of a community surrounding that. So I feel like I can go into you have credit union because they already understand like who I am as a customer and it's not seen as just by this kind of blank place blank person. So I think that was that 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 kind of willingness as well to, to take action. I like that. And I would just suggest to you I understand yeah. um you know, focus on students 
because that's if A would know and, and B where the data seems to be needing you. Yeah. I think you might be aiming a little bit low. Um, this would be bigger than that. Yeah, no, we're definitely thinking anyone that has a checking account or a savings account uh, would definitely be using this, especially people, anyone, yeah, basically. <laughs> we'll do one, one more short question. Sorry, I had something to go in the middle here. I think if you were able to have a knowledge base by your customer bank, yeah. to be able to say, here's the information that we want to be able to transmit to the customer, mm -hmm. but that's going to go a long ways towards having Sticking this on both the customer side and the bank side. That's great. That's great feedback. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much. Thank you guys so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyone on the wall? We'll, we'll take a little Feel free to sit down here unless you want to run out. Um, well, we have. A few more seats open. So this, uh, so our last presentation tonight, um, somebody I'm, I'm excited to introduce because I've crossed paths with him in so many ways since I moved here to Ann Arbor. Um, so this is Guy Suter from uh, Notion. Um, so Guy and I are both from Central PA. We both relocated to Ann Arbor without having any of our immediate family here. Um, we've both been involved in a few startups in town since we've been here. Um, and actually, the, the company I work at now was a company that Guy had helped co-found um, before he left a little over a year ago to run Notion full-time. So you have to say good things about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, to say it's a um, So uh, Notion's a really interesting app. I've been using the beta for probably the last six months or so. And um, it's a take on, call it this combination of email productivity, but really larger, like, you know, what What do you really need to get out of your email? And as you might be familiar with Inbox and all these other email products, with well, Notion, um, I'll, let, I'll let Guy pitch it properly, but um, I, I, I think about it as surfacing the information that's really important to me, um, and email just happens to be the conduit for that because it's something everybody has. Um, so I'm gonna get my laptop set up and let Guy present from there. But uh, if you want to give an intro while I get yeah. this going. Um, so, going. You know, first of all, uh, thanks for the warm interaction, Brian, and seeing all the very cool stuff tonight. I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out how you could survive on a jar of $20 for coffee. <laughs> I don't think I could do it, uh, but very, very cool. Um, you know, I, I want to start off with one, an apology and two, a request. Uh, my apology is that uh, I had a one hour meeting in Birmingham turn into a four and a half hour meeting today. Uh, so the really awesome slides that I was going to prepare to tell you all about Notion and who we are don't exist. Um, uh, as, uh, as a kind of better way to show you what we're up to, I'm just going to demo the app and actually use my own account. Um, that thereby means you may see things I wish you hadn't. Um, and so my request is that if you do see things I wish you hadn't and at any point while I'm using my phone, you immediately uh, promise to forget such things. You, you um, do realize we're videoing. And I realize you're videoing that. So this goes out to anybody that happens to watch the video in slow-mo and zoom in as well. There's a social contract between us all. And so that I know that it's binding, I want everybody now to say, you can trust us, Guy. You can trust us, Guy. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so this is my phone. <laughs> uh, so you know, I want to start by saying, uh, you know, Notion is, is not the first company, you know, I founded with, with my team of, of founders. Uh, we founded a number of companies. Um, this, is, this is kind of the company where we got to do anything we could possibly want to do. Um, and that's a, that's a really special um, a point to get to, and one that I feel you know, very fortunate about. Uh, I'm lucky to have a couple of technical co-founders that are brilliant and amazing to work with. Uh, when you find a really incredible team to work with, you just want to keep working with them and keep doing amazing stuff. Um, and so, uh, when we exited kind of our last thing uh, a couple years ago, some of you may know we moved to town and you know built a business inside Barracuda here. Uh, a couple years ago, we exited that. Uh, we really took a hard look at where we wanted to, where we wanted to spend our time and our energy. Um, and a couple things you know kept coming back. One, we really geek out on making very cool technology uh, and, and developing kind of like cutting edge new new stuff. Um, and then two, um, we really like to deal in scale. Uh, we have built kind of a very large backup business and scaled it out to you know, dozens of petabytes of, of storage um, and really enjoyed that process and, and seeing the scaling. Um, and then you know, three, uh, we were really um, just a little tired of, of B2B. 
uh, strictly speaking. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time, selling into some really incredible customers and, and businesses, but really had this desire to try to create something that we could share um, you know, on a personal level with people. You know, we wanted to make something that was universally useful. Um, so those were, those were sort of the guideposts that we used in deciding where we wanted to spend our time. Um, we ended up founding Notion, uh, you know, in our company we exist to help people communicate productively. It's a very simple kind of statement on, you know, what our purpose in life is. Um, and as we started sort of thinking through where are the biggest pain points that we all have in our communication and how we're doing things, email rose to the top extremely quickly. Uh, which is a little bit of a bummer for us because we have a long history in email I won't get into right now. Uh, but we had this kind of like a realization was like it's got to be email. I was like, oh, really? Again, email? <laughs> um, but you know, since we've gotten very passionate, very excited, and very enthusiastic about the potential of email, um, you know, so you know, I want to spend just a second kind of talking about kind of why why did we feel like it had to be email? Um, and you know, I've got some slides here that are kind of halfway done or whatever. But, you know, the one thing is, like, if your goal is to help people communicate productively, there's a couple universal truths that we all have uh, that we, we experience pain with. You know, the first one is uh, we spend a lot of time on it, right? So saving time managing our messages. You know, the digital communication age is amazing, but it means we're getting tons and tons of stuff all the time, and it's extremely hard to keep up, right? Uh, so we want to save time managing that flow. We want to get more focus out of the email that we're, we're doing so we can focus on, you know, the things that are important. We'd like to be more responsive to people. How many times have you started an email saying, I'm sorry for the delay, or it's taking me too long, or <coughs> right? So we would like to stop doing that, and we would like to actually be more responsive to people. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, email is, and any communication tool, whether it's email or Slack or text messaging or whatever it is, is really just the means that we have for building relationships and getting stuff done with people. It's not really the fact that we like doing email, it's that there's somebody on the other end of that that we're connecting with, and so we'd like to know more about people, we'd like to build stronger relationships. Um, so that's, that's kind of the top level tenet of, of how we went into this. And you know, if you think about email and, and its, its sort of presence today, um, it's actually enormous, and it, it's going to be enormous for a very long time, right? Um, you know, so every day there's 150 billion messages sent. Um, that compares roughly to about 10 billion messages posted on Facebook, just to give you an idea of scale in terms of volume. Uh, 4,200 words, and, you know, communicated per person, uh, and each and every one of us, you know, I have you know, kind of professional jobs, spend two plus hours a day dealing with their email. So it's a huge part of what we do. Um, so one of the realizations we came to is we were like, well, how can we solve this? You know, lots of people have tried. There's lots of skeletons in, you know, along the road. Um, we, we came to this thing that you know, UX, UI alone won't get us there. It's not just about building a better swipe or building a better interaction. We need something more than that. We need something that transcends that because we've, we've taken that pretty much as far as it can go. And even you know, Dropbox recently you know, kind of put the, you know, the exclamation point on this when they decided to shut down Mailbox. Uh, the mailbox app, you know, and the, and the quote was, you know, we realize there's only so much an email app can do to fundamentally improve communications. And we, by the way, totally agree with them, right? Um, and so our strategy was, and our hypothesis on day one was, well, what if we can build an intelligence layer on top of your email that's, that's personalized to you, that learns from your behavior, from your history, and helps you do the things that you do really regularly a lot faster? and then helps you get value that you didn't even expect out of your email that you know, lets you do the, the ultimate thing, which is build strong relationships better. Um, so that's what I'm gonna show you in my, my account now. Um, so we got busy, um, and within a, a month or so, kind of put up our first prototype and started using it. Uh, it was so impactful on my you know, daily workflow that you know, really quickly we got to a point where it's like, wow, even if we you know, end up not doing the company, um, we still need to keep this running because this is a lifesaver and I could never go back to the old way that you used to do email. Um, fast forward nearly you know, two years later from that point, um, and we have we've put our app in both the uh, iOS app store and the Android store. Uh, we're right in the validation stage right now, so we did that late November, uh, pulled in our first thousand users and are learning a ton from our first kind of beyond friends and family users. Um, so that's, that's kind of the exciting point that we're at uh, right now. Uh, so I'm going to go into the Notion app, and you know, one of the benefits of being in this slog fest of a meeting this afternoon was that I haven't checked my email all day. Um, so this actually demos really well. Um, so you can see I've got my Notion app at the bottom of the screen there. We have a really cute little smiley face envelope because we think that um, your email app should garner as much love on your phone as all the other apps that you love. Um, and then uh, you can see I have 60 unread messages. Uh, so uh, you know, real quickly before I actually go into the app, I'm going to show you an experience outside the app. 
Uh, how many people have email notifications turned on their phone? Push notifications that actually make a buzz or whatever. Okay, how many people decided that it's way too much noise and not enough signal and turned them off? Okay, very representative of the world, right? Um, most people have actually turned them off and the people that haven't get a lot of stuff that doesn't really need to interrupt them, doesn't need to buzz their pockets. Uh, if I look at my push notifications for today, um, I can actually go back to the beginning of the day here uh, and just see, uh, I, got a, I got a push notification from Andy Fowler, from Laura, somebody I'm working with on the App Store Marketing, Jordan, Shannon, Heidi, Keith, uh, Katie, uh, Evan Eufer, and Andy, and uh, Asher's kindergartner teacher at Eber White uh, Elementary, who's amazing, uh, Tyler Tate, uh, and Skip Sims. And that's, that's the only times that my phone actually buzzed for an email notification. Um, you know, it, some of the times I was actually looking at the phone, you know, it didn't need to notify me, but that's it, right? Uh, but if I actually go into my inbox, I've got a lot more email than that, right? Because I haven't been checking my email or triaging it and cleaning it out all day. Um, so what we've done is basically created a personal AI. And it actually looks at your email history and it, 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 it looks at your behavior and your relationships with people and whether you normally reply to them and makes this very highly accurate prediction on whether this email is quote unquote important to you. Right? Whether this is something that should interrupt you, whether this is something that should you know, get your focus, or whether this is something that you're probably just going to get rid of once you get it. Not necessarily spam, because you might want to see it in your inbox. You might actually want to see that it happened. You know, sometimes I want to see the, um, the uh, Amazon shipping notices so I can see what my wife bought and what's shipping out or whatever. But most of the time I don't really need to deal with it. I don't need to reply with it. And it doesn't live in my inbox very fast, very long. right? And so, uh, so that's what we've got here, right? So as I'm looking through my inbox, you can see these things that are actually smaller, like these top three messages on Twitter uh, have less caption to them, uh, so I can look at more of them on t at a time. Uh, there's some treatment you can't actually see on the projector that makes them kind of like sub subtle, more subtle than the more important ones. Uh, and they have these little blue check marks on the side, which means Notion has what we call pre-checked these messages for cleanup. Uh, if I agree with, with it, instead of taking three swipes here to get rid of these messages, I just push the fancy button and it immediately archives them uh, the way that I would normally do. Now this is set up you know, for power user mode for me, so like one tap archive, uh, but there's some, there's some elections there that new users can make. Um, so you know, kind of fundamentally what we realized was when people check email on their phone, uh, they're, you know, often they're scanning down through looking for that important thing, but they're not actually going to triage mode. They don't go into multi-edit mode and tap 50 things or swipe things. You know, they're standing in line for the coffee looking for something important. Uh, but what this interface actually lets you do is as you're scanning, you're also triaging. So you keep up with your inbox and you keep it clean and you keep it down to just the stuff that you need to, to, to deal with. And that makes all the difference. So what I'm actually going to do now is actually just triage my inbox right in front of you for the day, right? So I can see, uh, we'll see if uh, Notion made all the right elections here. Uh, it, it's keeping the thing from Andreessen and Horowitz and not from Marvel Entertainment, so that's great. Um, yeah, we got some meetup notifications. I don't need those because uh, I'm already here. Um, and that's, that's all good. So I'll push the button and 14 threads uh, were just archived for me in one tap as opposed to 14 swipes. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can continue, you can continue to go down through that, right? So you know, I can literally so just... And, and let's just say there hasn't. Oh, what? I'm oh, sorry. Well, it's just went to sleep. Oh boy. Let's see. Are we back online? Yep. Okay. So let's say uh, there isn't actually any of these that I care about or want. Uh, but let's let's say there was. I have no idea. This is probably marketing, right? So that's that's marketing. Um, but let's say there was. Let's say I wanted this thing from Amerigas, right? I could just simply swipe it over and tell Notion that I want to keep it. That obviously you know, changes the treatment on the screen, but it also helps Notion learn in the future that that might be something I want to keep. So these are learning events. As you're using the app in kind of a very a natural way, uh, Notion's learning how to be better in the future. So I'm just going to finish uh, triaging my entire inbox in front of you real quickly, um, just so you can get an idea of you know, how different this process is um, you know, from, your, from your typical kind of uh, email uh, workflow. And so now, uh, I'm actually down to just the stuff I care about. After an entire day of email, I've got 27 messages, uh, and I only got you know, a handful of notifications just about things that were, were actually important to me. Um, there's, there's a bunch, you know, this is a unified inbox across all my, my mailboxes, so there's a, nice, a bunch of really nice kind of you know, polish and stuff throughout. We spent a lot of time really trying to you know, make this a, you know, not an MVP email app, because we don't think anybody wants to use an MVP email app. Um, but uh, but that's kind of the, the synopsis of how it impacts and changes your workflow in the inbox itself. Um, 
you know, one of the things I'll show you before I show you some of the advanced features here, how are we doing on time? Well, we're about up. Okay, <laughs> all right, really quickly. All right, I'm gonna go with power user mode. You can see Notion saved me 3,776 swipes. I don't know how to turn that into human capital yet. We haven't run the, we haven't run the uh, energy uh, conversion. The other thing we're doing is looking at the email flow as it's going in and out, actually looking at the content of the message. So we determine whether or not the sender wants a reply from you, and then we actually pull out the snippet that they want to reply to. So really quickly, I can see that I have three people, four or five people are waiting on for me to respond. And uh, they're actually, uh, these are actually the questions. It's a you know, whole emails that have been sent. We've pulled out the questions. I can see exactly what they want me to respond to. I can see the people that I've emailed uh, specific questions to who haven't responded to me and how long it's been. Um, so you know, I can go back and nudge them and, and get them to re be more responsive. Uh, and then finally, where we think you know, the, the biggest potential for you know, our company uh, long term is this people section where it's basically the biggest network you already have in your email. You know, it's all of our own big data, but it's not activated at all right now. Uh, so in Notion, everybody you've ever emailed becomes a contact. Uh, we can help you keep track of the people that you've recently met. Uh, and you might want to you know, pull somebody out of there and tell Notion that you want to stay in touch. So it'll help make sure that you have regular contact with that person, uh, put them on a special list where you can see how long it's been you know, since you, uh, since you talked to them. Uh, you can go in and see your connection strength. You can see contact details, which are automatically parsed out of signature blocks, your shared connections based on real data, uh, and your message history. So you can get context about that relationship all very, very quickly. Um, and I could, I could demo a bunch of more stuff, but I think I'm we'll outside. switch the questions. All right. <laughs> who, who else is excited that this is being built in Ann Arbor? Do some questions. Uh, what's the product roadmap for this? You, you say you started with email, yeah. so I have to assume there's other things coming. Like yeah. Um, so we, we we have pretty ambitious goals, uh, <laughs> but you know we we think there's a lot uh, to fix in email and a lot of value that can be extracted that's not being extracted. Uh, but certainly, you know things like the waiting section where you can see questions that have been asked of you and you know whether or not you're blocking people. You know, it's one of the most interesting sections because like I'll be demoing it you know, with somebody using it with their data for the first time and that they'll actually leave the conversation for a moment. They'll be like, oh wait, oh wait, I need to get back to it. Like, they'll, they'll be realizing this kind of in real time. It's happened numerous times. Um, and you can see like, there's lots of other channels where that could apply. You know, somebody like Slack has actually really reinvented instant messaging inside of companies. It's no longer instant messaging. You know, I get questions in Slack that sometimes take a day or so to respond to, right? So you can see bubbling some of that stuff up or from the other channels as well. Um, so we definitely have some ideas on sort of how we go beyond email there. Um, and then, you know, really just kind of like, you know, activating this intelligence layer. Like, what can we do to help you do the things you normally do a lot faster, get value that you didn't expect or you didn't, you know, didn't know you could even get, uh, and then kind of translate that into this networking piece. Next question over here. What's your revenue model? Um, so we're, we're really lucky to have kind of a very aligned investor group, you know, that believes that this is one of those big enough problems to solve that the real goal should be solving it for individuals and that should be our focus for kind of years to come. Um, you know, we have lots of ideas sort of about where the monetization piece will come in here. Um, but really right now we have this lens, you know, where, you know, we founded our company on sort of three core principles. You know, one being uh, being trustworthy, you know, earning the user's trust. Uh, and that's kind of our paramount, you know, our, our core pro brand promise is you're in control, right? Uh, the second being daring, that we actually believe that, you know, technology and kind of innovation and the latest and greatest is, is a good thing. Um, and three being kind of this, this, this affection for users and love and trying to create that experience. So at the end of the day, it's not going to be, you know, to monetize through advertising or something that creates a really negative experience. We would only look at those avenues if it actually created a positive experience. Um, but there's, there's numerous different avenues, some on the user level, some on team level and team engagement, and, and some on platform levels. Is your learning uh, based on neural nets or heuristics or yeah? Basic so um, we we started our backup company, our data backup company, in 2004 with zero experience in storage and backups. And we started our artificial intelligence company uh, in 2013 with zero experience in artificial intelligence. But we're really fast learners, um, and you know, having a blast, you know, getting caught up. Uh, and we have some really great relationships, one with Jason Mars and his, his research team at uh, Clarity Lab over at the university uh, CS, CS department. Um, and you know, we're, we're using mostly heuristical uh, analysis now, you know, based on kind of algorithms and projections and then learning, learning steps on top of that. 
uh, and some NLP. Uh, we have uh, we have a DNN set up for sentiment, which will create some you know future features that we're looking at. Uh, so we're starting to play around with DNNs and, and like recurrent neural networks and long-term, short-term memory. Uh, at the end of the day, like the most important thing to us is that we're creating this intelligence experience on top of the communication. And it's delivering real value. And you know the exact way that we do that on the back end isn't so important to me. We would we definitely want to make sure that we know where the latest greatest thinking is because if that's the if that's the silver bullet that creates the transcendiary like user experience, then we want to be all about it and we want we want to be limited. But we're not we're also not just going through an intellectual exercise of is it possible to stand up a DNN and create a good experience? Uh, we kind of let the experience drive that decision. Next question. Um, two questions. First question. Um, does any message data have to be stored on your servers? And second question, how long do you think it will take for a government agency to approach you for this program? <laughs> um, I'll answer the second one first. Um, surprisingly, and Andy Blyther's in the audience, I won't ask him to comment because I'm sure it'll be highly confidential, uh, but he can attest that surprisingly, uh, for the 10 years that I was part of building the, the data backup company, uh, we actually never had a, a qualified government agency come and ask for, for data from us, you know, across thousands and thousands of business customers and, you know, lots and lots of petabytes. Um, so, you know, one, I don't think it happens quite as often, you know, even with copy in, in the consumer space there. Kanye West was upset, however, that somebody had posted his new album on copy uh, and uh, distributed it. Uh, but I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the previous question, uh, being trustworthy is something you earn. It's not something like I don't come in front of the room and say, hey, you should trust us. Obviously, we're looking, you know, our, our computers are looking at your data to be able to create this awesome experience. Something I'm very passionate about. Like, and I think, I think what we ultimately need to figure out how to do in the startup world is create a framework for what are the best practices? How do we do that? How do you communicate that so that users out in the world can actually gain that trust and they can validate it? That framework doesn't exist right now. Um, and you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see us play an active role of trying to like, create that framework. Uh, one of the things we've done is gone far beyond what any startup at our stage normally does in this kind of case. We have you know, a very explicit privacy policy, security policy, technical policy. We have security practice policies internally that all of our employees sign. Uh, and they disclose exactly what we store and what we don't store. Luckily for us, we don't have to store that much. We store some metadata about the relationships between your email accounts. Uh, and we, if you uh, are doing the waiting list, we store uh, the snippets of the questions because there's really no other good way to pull those off of the email servers. Other than that, everything is transitory and goes kind of through the proxy and, and we don't store it. Yeah. One, one more question. I, I just had a response. I actually was part of a startup that was bought by Shuri and, and we built and ran all the cloud services to do all the backups of all the phones for every carrier in North America. And we used to get requests from the FBI weekly um, to release data. So it, it, it happens quite often, depending on the type of information, both, both contacts and pictures we, had, we would have to release. Yeah, that, I mean, it wasn't my experience. I did get a call from one FBI agent that tried to get us to give data, but you know, he couldn't produce a court order, so we didn't. Uh, yeah. It's the only one I can recall. Um, and you know, that, that was three million users using a file sync share service and then uh, something like 50 petabytes. Uh, but it, I agree with you, the use matters a lot and the type of people matter a lot. And email is one of those things that a lot of people use. So you know, it's reasonable to assume that you know, some government agency would come and ask us for that stuff. We've detailed how we would respond to that in our privacy policy, which is basically to tell them to take a hike unless we're legally required to, to do something. Uh, as, as much as humanly possible, that's our stance, right? Like it's, it's not their data and if they are gonna compel us to help them take it, then they have to compel us. Um, that's, our, that's our representation to the user. And you know, very luckily in this business, we don't have to store that much of it, so we don't actually even have it. Uh, and if I could figure out a way to encrypt the data that we do have to store in a way that we couldn't even reproduce it, I would. We've actually had lengthy discussions about uh, some of those ideas, uh, but you know, the world needs to catch up a little bit. Um, but you know, this goes to our second core tenet, which is daring. You know, we believe in a positive, optimistic outlook of the future. And then we believe that technology is taking us to a place where we're really reaching our full potential and that we have to figure out a way to embrace that without being scared of it. Uh, it doesn't come without its challenges, for sure. And that's a wrap. Cool. All right, thanks guys. So community announcement time. If you got any announcements to make, you're looking for a job, you're hiring, you have another meetup like this, um, come down around front and just uh, like.
kind of where I'm standing, make a line maybe on that side would be awesome. Um, and we'll get this going. Um, I, I, I have my community announcement I wanted to make while people are lining up. So, uh, so if anybody is in product management or product marketing and you got some spare time, because um, I'm sure you do, uh, and you want to do a meetup, uh, hit me up because I, I, I would love to see this happen. Um, I just I personally don't have the bandwidth for it. I'm in product management and product marketing. Um, so that's one. Two, related to that, the Ann Arbor Lean Startup Circle. I attended my first one this past week. It's a really cool group. Um, normally they get together at uh, Hook Logic. Next month, I think I might be presenting, but look for that in the, just sort of search Ann Arbor Lean Startup Circle. If you want like a much more intimate version of this, like 10 people beating up your plan, where it's a little less embarrassing, um, it's a really great meetup. Um, and finally, number three, one, be uh, okay if I didn't uh, plug a job. Nutshell is currently looking for a new head of marketing. I wore this hat part-time, wasn't originally what I came on for, so if you know anyone that has um, B2B software as a service uh, marketing experience, both on the demand gen side um, and just overall somebody that would own a marketing program, uh, contact me. All right, next up. Hi, I'm Doug Song, uh, CEO of Duo Security. Uh, we're co-hosting a uh, film at the Michigan Theater on February 9th that we invited everybody to called Code Documentary, and it's a film about debugging the gender gap in technology. Um, it'll be followed at, if you go to codedocumentary.com, you'll, you'll see some of the trailers. Um, it'll be followed by a panel where we have uh, folks from Google, folks from Duo, and a few others, um, to again, t discuss a little bit about why there are more women in technology and what things we can actually do to help improve the situation. Thank you. I don't have any film to plug. I'm Jeff Blackman. I'm the former CFO and CEO <laughs> of 4C. 4C was, still is, uh, a great company in Ann Arbor. Uh, I joined when they were eight million. Uh, we're going to be over 80 million this year. I have left the company as of last week. Decided that was a wrap. That was it after eight years and after a couple of acquisitions. It was a great ride. But I just want to let you know that I am a free agent. And so to the extent that you have an interesting young growing company, that's my expertise, helping young companies to scale and grow, eventually to an exit. So let me know, see me after the meeting, or contact me at blackman.jeff at gmail.com, blackman.jeff at gmail.com. Thanks. I'm Travis Linderman from Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, starting tomorrow and going for it weekly every Wednesday at 9 a.m., we are starting a small mentorship workshop for founders. And basically, we're going to limit it to five to ten founders per week, and we have scheduled out all the way to May. There'll be serial entrepreneurs, industry experts, kind of focus, and basically, there's a lot of people in this room that I'll probably be asking to join us to teach as we go forward. But just if you can reach out to me, Travis at Ann Arbor Spark and get you more information. We started with a, just a private invite list, but within the next couple of weeks, we'll open it to everybody. So if there's interest, I'd like to get you more information as we go forward. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Judes. Um, I am working on uh, an idea that I'm hoping to develop into a real product soon. It's basically, um, you know, when you're a student and you have to sign up for classes, you have to have to go talk to a human being called academic, academic advisor, and they tell you exactly the order in which you're supposed to take them. There's constraints. You know, if you are if you're a science major, you have to do them in this order. This class requires that. There's genetics and stuff like that. That's what I'm trying to automate. There's nothing automated in the whole country, actually in the whole world. There's three apps that get closed, but they kind of solve it from a the banking app facing the bank teller kind of way. Uh, and so I have, a, have some fundamentals built, I have a rules engine, I have some things that are sort of working, but I need data. So actually I'm looking for, if anybody knows, anybody like that, U of M registrar's office or um, in the IT office, people who are maybe willing to have like a, a sandbox environment where they can provide some data, uh, that's where I'm at. So I'm just looking for contacts in that respect. Thanks. Okay. 
So hi, I'm Michael Bloom, this is Stephen Woodcock. Uh, I'm a professor here at the law school and I have a startup called Practio. Essentially, it is Rosetta Stone for contracts. And uh, we are hiring a graphic designer with user experience, experience. Uh, so if that's interesting at all, happy to chat more about it. I'll, I'll stick around and then also. Oh yeah, so like Michael said, we've developed a product that's Rosetta Stone for contracts, it's interactive. Uh, the next thing we want to do though is develop a similar product for non-lawyers. The, the current one that we have is used to educate junior lawyers. We want to use it to teach startups and business people that have to deal with contracts. A quick and easy about one hour primer on how to do that better. Before we start developing that, we really want to talk to some startups and people that have to do this. So if you're interested in spending four, maybe five hours going through this process and are willing to give us feedback on how we can change it, how it would be better for business people, it would be free. Come find us. We'd love to talk to you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Russell Schindler and I'm from Traverse City and uh, I've been coming down to this uh, A2 New Tech meeting for uh, two years plus now. And I loved it so much that I copied it exactly and started one in Traverse City. TCNewTech.org. Uh, so what I'm standing up here is I'm trying to recruit some of you people who might be interested in pitching in Traverse City. It's a great town, especially in the summer. So uh, come and talk to me or just go to TCNewTech.org. Hi, my name is Kim Tarolski, and I'm a co-founder of a new startup that intends to provide um, software as a service to insurance consultants. And we are ready to build our MVP. I'm looking for a database type programmer and uh, possibly an IT co-founder. So if you're interested or you might know um, somebody who's interested, please see me. I'll, I'll stay and I have some business cards. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Feldkamp. I work for Optimi as our recruiting manager. We're the fastest growing IT staffing firm in the country. Uh, our office is in Livonia locally. We serve clients from Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor over to Detroit, up to Troy and Auburn Hills basically right now. Um, we have a lot of direct hire uh, opportunities with our clients. Seeking out uh, a senior Ruby developer in Brighton and also looking for software development leads in cloud and embedded systems for a major player in the infotainment space, and that's located in Farmington Hills. I'll be around after. Feel free to stop over if you know of anybody or you yourself is interested. And if you work for a company that's struggling to find somebody, also love to speak with you. Thanks. Hey guys, my name is Scott Gosey. I run a couple organizations in town. Uh, one of them is called uh, A2 Brewtech. So it's kind of the uh, sister organization to A2 New Tech events. And it usually happens two weeks after an A2 New Tech event. So two weeks from now and one day on Wednesday, uh, there'll be a A2 Brewtech at Mezzovino downtown. And so it's on the A2 New Tech homepage. You can go up and uh, sign up for it. It's free to come to. It's basically a social event for guys to uh, come together and discuss startups and uh, discuss how to uh, uh, drink more beers, uh, and then I also run a group called uh, Coffeehouse Coders, which helps people learn how to code. And that's on Meetup as well, Ann Arbor Coffeehouse Coders, but hope to see you guys at the Brewtech uh, on February 3rd, which I think, believe is a Wednesday. So, and not, and not just guys. Yes, correct. Yes, like, sorry. Uh, everyone's uh, invited to come as long as they're inter interested in entrepreneurship, so. Good call, because I, for one, truly enjoy my beer. Um, and also, you had a wonderful expose in NPR Radio for right. tctechnewtech.org. Right. So you'll probably see me there on February 2nd. Uh, so I wear two hats. I do business development for both Open Logics Corporation as well as Hub.io. Um, that's me. My name is Arthi Chandra. And on behalf of Hub.io, I am looking for a PHP developer and engineer. So if you know of anyone who is willing to work in the Wixom area, uh, please holler at me. It is hchandra at open-logics.com. And I also can help out with staff augmentation. We do mobile development as well as very good at security. Uh, so go ahead and find me with a beer at the Pizza House, and I look forward to meeting you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Tarek Sullivan and this is my first uh, meeting here. Uh, I have a project uh, that deals with blockchain technology. If anyone is interested in blockchain technology, uh, more specifically blockchain 2.0 technology, 
which uh, deals with uh, decentralized uh, uh, applications or dApps. Uh, this project is specifically uh, for the Ethereum platform, if anyone is familiar with that. Uh, I am uh, looking to build a team of uh, developers, uh, C++, uh, Go, JavaScript. Uh, so if anyone is interested in that, the project is etherblockchain.io. Uh, I've got an incredible opportunity to uh, build something uh, that could be very substantial in the uh, Ether uh, ecosystem, Ethereum ecosystem. So I'm hanging out uh, after. Would love to chat with anyone who's interested in blockchain technology. Thanks. Hello, my name is Mark Mojica. I am a volunteer with the Bryant Pattengill uh, PTO. Uh, I'm helping to put together a tech night. Uh, if you have any technology you'd like to share with um, elementary students, uh, please see me. Um, I'll be taking uh, virtual reality, Oculus, uh, Google Glass, some other things, just to get them to experience technology, get excited about it. So, thank you. Once again, Mark Mojica. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, even though we only had three companies pitching today, I think we managed to make this one of the longest uh, A2D techs. Uh, so, we wrap up here, like, mingle around, meet people around here, and, and mosey out within like 10 minutes. And we'll head over to Pizza House, which is on 618 Church Street. It's a few blocks from here. And uh, just a reminder the next meetup here will happen on Tuesday, February 16th at 6 30. Same time, if you know anyone to pitch, hit me up. Thanks, everyone.